Hello, welcome to the Composer Conversations podcast. My name is Alex Berner. I'm a composer, and here we have conversations. Pretty straightforward. But my goal here is to dive a little deeper and get a little bit more philosophical about being a composer. How do we live our lives day to day? What are the values that create the foundation for our goals? What is a life well lived? And how does our relationship with music incorporate into this? Today I'm talking with Kyle Franklin. He's a good friend, great musician, and very intelligent guy. When I made a list of the people I interact with the most and what traits about them influence me, the ones I wrote for him were excitement, joy, craft, self-reliance, and self-checking. And with that, I present to you Kyle Franklin. Cool. So I want to get started kind of talking about um, your story, right? Kind of hit the first section of the podcast. And we actually met through the world of bodybuilding and lifting through a team in Boston called The Next Level through a guy named Christian Mady. And I actually saw you wobbling around the gym before I knew you were a composer. So I, I didn't know you were in my program. I didn't know you were in my school. Just like, oh, there's that guy. It was this, look at this meat head. You know, look. <laughs> um, Dude, that's the funniest thing because both you and Christian have – told me that you saw me in the gym before you knew me and I was completely oblivious to all that I was like a Christian noticed it he's like yeah I, I figured you wouldn't have noticed because you were just like so in your zone but there are like a number of people that were there right it's like if you start if you want to get a car all of a sudden you start seeing that model everywhere and of course it's not that suddenly everyone is now driving Ford Fiestas it's like they were always there you just brain your brain wasn't selecting for it so it's like there were always these people there that I was going to end up meeting and know, but like my brain was just, they were not on the radar. That's hysterical. Yeah, <laughs> no, totally. So talk to me about life before the muscles. Um, how, what got you into wanting to write music and what made you end up at Berkeley? It was dark life before the muscles, Alex. It was, it's not, it was dark times. Um, I don't know, I guess. It all came down to when uh, my family moved me out of California and put me into Texas, which uh, ended up being like the best thing that ever happened to both my the family and my myself and my development. But as like a young angsty teenager, because I had just graduated uh, eighth grade, right? So you're about to go into your first year of high school and your parents are like, yeah, we're not doing that. We're going to a different state. And you're like, come on guys you're ruining my life. There's no coming back from this. It's over. It's game over, man. So uh, it obviously wasn't. I went over to, to Texas and because I was like, not super social, I was happy with the friend group that I had. And it's like, oh, now I got to make new friends. People suck. I don't want to, I don't want to do that. Um, I basically just like dove into music making and I, my first instrument is the guitar. So I played just way too much guitar, uh, sort of started gearing things toward music. And I don't even know why. It wasn't ever a very conscious decision, um, or at least not a well thought out one, to have this just be the thing. It was like, I just enjoy it. I'm good at it. Let's keep it going. And so I started just noticing little avenues to keep like ticking the box forward like there was a music theory class uh, at the an AP music theory class at the high school so I was like you know I'll do that and uh, on the class we had these little iPads so right because it was this was back in the day when not every school had like iPads for everybody which I think some of them still don't but my school had started just juniors and seniors can try them to see if electronically enhanced learning is possible and so we were using like the GarageBand keyboard to like illustrate intervals and chord building. And I was like, oh, this thing is kind of cool. Let me like just get a piano and like see what happens. And then I did the same thing with the piano that I did with the guitar. I played it way too much um, and got pretty decent at it pretty fast. And then I was just looking at, as I learned more about music theory and more about the piano, the type of music I listened to started shifting from like really intense rock and metal to more like orchestral and film type music and that's when I just I just sort of kept slowly orienting myself to like what was in front of me that I found interesting like okay it's the guitar okay now it's music theory now it's the piano now it's orchestral music 
what's, in my opinion, the most interesting ap application today of orchestral music. It's in film. So, uh, so then I just started filtering through. And then when film scoring became the beacon that I was following, Berkeley became the obvious choice. And I literally just from that point was like, all right, so and I'm at, I'm almost like a junior in high school at this point. So we're getting close to, uh, you know, sending college applications. And I'm just like, I guess Berkeley will be the thing. So I interviewed at Berkeley with like less than a year of self-taught piano experience, less than a f just a few months of haphazard orchestral composition that was filtered through um, the orchestra director who would just look through the scores and tell me the things that were abhorrently like not playable, like, dude, tubas can't do that. And I was like, oh, okay, what can a tuba do? He's like this, this was, this, this is great tuba writing, but you put it in a French horn, like swap some things around. So it's like that, that all just tossed into a Berkeley application and somehow that was enough for the rascals to let me in. Nice. I feel like I BS my way into that school. Like, and it, it feels, I almost feel like I have a responsibility to like try to make something happen with, the education I got in the music because I hear so many stories about people that like it was there for I mean for me the path to Berkeley was a decision that was made during the span of a couple months and then there were a couple months that led into the application and then it was of course after that it's out of your hands right they let you in or you don't but there are people that you know orient their lives from a much younger age this is where I'm going to go and they spend much more prep time in servicing that goal. And like somehow they still don't get in. And I met people that, you know, in our first semesters that were uh, like second or third time applicants. And they're like, yeah, I mean, I, ca I kept coming back up better each time, took some feedback. And it's like, and that's amazing for you. But I'm sitting there asking myself like, well, how in the heck did like, I very much doubt that I'm just like fundamentally on this level i'm like so how did i slip through the cracks so that's exactly yeah, I, that's <laughs> I i was like looking back at my skill level when i applied i was like it really you know I, isn't berkeley's motto like to be rather than to seem to be i think that's like their school like saying or whatever yeah i, I, I think what berkeley selects for to a degree is um is potential I, I think that that's what, at least personally, that's the only thing that I think I got across in my interview because everything was like mediocre at best. Um, but when you like the, it's one of those things where it's like it combined, it's greater than just the, the sum of the parts. Uh, you, you put it all together and it's like, okay, so it's only been playing piano for uh, less than a year, taught himself, was able to play a pretty difficult piece, not perfectly, but given, that's impressive, uh, has like, basic ear training like limited sight reading but i mean taught himself okay so there's there's something there um uh, wrote these orchestral scores by himself with like little to no so it's like i just had this level of gumption to just like oh look at this let me do this now and just like without a care in the world that i i guess the decision would have been like when you put the access and the education in front of that person uh, can they can they rise up to float with the other ships or are they going to get swallowed by the sea of intensity that is Berkeley's curriculum and like you know his, history tells and I was able to get through it but uh, I think that that's one of the things that Berkeley selects for because so many of right their like motto is built around not motto but their sort of culture is built around like taking the niche talented prodigy of some random thing and like giving them resources to see if this person changes the world in music and like some of them have right that's that's like Berkeley's deal is they actually have the track record of you know the John Mayers the Charlie Puth the people that the, the Alan Silvestri's the Howard Shores the people that were only there for a short amount of time or the full amount of time that went on to go do something huge so I think they just look at the people with the potential and they go, okay, that's nice. You've gotten a little bit of the way. You're not good. At, the way I put it is I wasn't good enough to graduate Berkeley when I got into Berkeley, but I was good enough to get in. And it's like, and everything else after that is, can you do the legwork? And, you know, as you, as you know, people that you probably met that dropped out, some people can, some people can't. 
um, with just the workload, not even talking about the finances, which is another bag of worms. But uh, so I, th I think that's what Berkeley sort of does because they're sort of hedging their bets on if we pick someone who's just like a great closet producer but doesn't know anything about modern recording techniques or this, but they just have amazing production chops. And we just give them access to the MP&E or the EPD suites. Like, can we come up with and allow this person to become the next, like, you know, savant in their field? I feel like that's how Berkeley's admission thought process works, just from the outsiders looking in. Yeah, that makes sense. I'm, I'm pretty sure I got in 100% because of my ear. Like, they put that piece of music in front of me to sight read nothing. Like I could, if I had brought my clarinet, I could have read it. But since I was on guitars, like I've uh, never read a piece uh, of music <laughs> on guitar and like uh, half of the other stuff I had no idea, but my just improv, right. When they just jammed, you know, when I jammed with one of the people like on piano that like went super well. And I was like, that's gotta be why I got in also probably because I didn't tell the interviewer. I was like, I want to do film scoring, not guitar you know, performance. If I had told him guitar performance, I don't I think I might've gotten a different answer. <laughs> yeah. Uh, kind of talking about the workload and how people drop out or, you know, leave. I mean, you had that extra bad because you were a double major. So what made you want to major both in film scoring and composition? Um, because the things that I appreciate most about the film scoring is the application of composition, right? Now there is there is the market of film scoring that is sort of the more sound designy, atmospheric, uh, layer like sort of soundscape aspect of music construction, and I'm less interested in that one. Although um, I'm actually, I suppose I'm more interested in that one from a listener's perspective. It's more interesting to me, but from a practical, where are my skill sets? That's not the realm that I. Um, dra gravitate towards. I'm much more into the sort of compositional process, the structuring up of music using uh, motifs like in the scores that I love the most that have done that we could think of like very obviously there's the Star Wars light motifs there's the Lord of the Rings where you can just see how themes are getting transformed recently also I would include um, John Powell's How to Train Your Dragon trilogy in that because he's very good with making new themes in each film but also constantly keeping the tapestry woven strong with all of the material. So I like the compositional aspect of film scoring and writing those types of scores and thinking in that way with regards to music. Um, so that led me to the, to the double major because I realized that the film scoring is not going to go through like film scoring is too big, right? Like Berkeley's film scoring program is the most comprehensive film scoring program that I know for undergrads. And it still is like a film scoring 101 in its entirety. You, I mean, it's just, there's too much. It's too big of a thing you've got. And the fact that young film scores are the jack of all trades, right? Because you've got to mix, produce, record, all of that stuff, schedule, you've got to, do licensing, you've got to make your cue sheets, you got to do music editing, literally every single thing that is part of the process when you start out, like guess who's responsible for it? Right there, buddy. Mm -hmm. So they, in trying to teach you how to just function in all of those realms, there's no deep dive in real writing music. There's no deep dive in like, what are the true master techniques of orchestration? Because there just can't be you would need probably a 12 year degree program to like actually comprehensively learn everything to that degree in, that is involved in film scoring. So at that point, I've, and I noticed a lot of people did this in film scoring, you sort of double major in what you want to, to be good at or to focus on with how it ties into film scoring because there's three majors that tie into those parts of film scoring and it's EPD, mp and &E, and composition all filter right into a facet of film scoring, whether it's on the writing, recording, or production side of it, those things all tie in. So I went with the the writing, but I went, I remember a bunch of kids that also doubled with uh, electronic production or recording production. And so you say like, I made it hard on myself, but I only made it like a little extra hard on myself because the people that really made it hard on themselves did the double in a production major. Because those, those poor bastards, got absolutely floored with uh, the amount of work that they had to do. But yeah, I, I just always have liked the more 
the music composition aspect of storytelling. And it's like, I'll just try to figure out the mixing and production stuff on the back end. But I've always, the heart of it has always been for me how the music writing itself sort of can tell the story. And I feel like to be able to at least start moving towards that, I wanted a better understanding and more practice of just how to compose music in general. So that led me to the to the double in in composition. Yeah, no, I, th- I think that's a, a good way to put it. And to begin to specialize early on, you know, even though it's it's, you know, probably hard to get that very specific job description immediately, I think it still is good to have a specialty, right? And to have something that you're aiming for and know you're aiming for. Um, so how, how valuable do you think the pro- college program is to entering the world of film scoring? Do you think it's a necessity? Do you think that it's something you could have learned on your own? Or is it really just kind of a shortcut? It's, um, it's not even a shortcut. It's, it's like a, um, okay, imagine if you started Monopoly, right? Everybody, the, 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 the lie of Monopoly, and I believe this was inten- intentional in its design, the lie of Monopoly is that everybody starts at the same place with the same resources, mm-hmm. right? Berkeley lets you start Monopoly with like an extra $2,000, but you still start at zero. Berkeley doesn't start you with property. It's like, you know, it, it gives you an edge with just a little bit more, but at the end of the day, you can squander those resources because it's so to get to the necessity, it's not a necessity. Obviously, very obviously, some of the best people don't go to get the education because they just, they just do it right they're just like through circumstances there's always a bit of luck involved in this stuff when you get to networking and gigs and whatnot but through other circumstances some people can just do their thing in their bedroom at home go to some random festivals talk to some people show the right person the right thing and they get the beginnings of their career which which turns into the to the magnum opus so it's like, it's definitely not needed. It's an absolute grind if you wanted to do that by yourself. There's so much trial and error that Berkeley cuts out for you with seasoned professionals letting you know, hey, don't do this. This is unwise. Don't, you know, like I think one of the biggest fundamental lessons that you have to learn if you want to be good at film music is that it's not about your music. Like, and you can't even write music thinking musically because it'll never work. Every time I like approach a cue and I'm thinking musically, what should I do? I'm thinking like secondary dominance or sub fives or, or harmony or meter. Like anytime I'm really thinking musically, it's, it's not going to work. It has to start with the story and the storytelling and the scene. And then you have to translate that to music. But it's like, it, it's, as I see it, it's not really a backwards compatible process. I can't, if you're starting with music and translating to story, it's like that to me is just like, you're trying to sort of force it to graft onto the scene as opposed to letting it be the other way around where the scene is informing everything. And like, I mean, you're probably a a member of some like these Facebook forums and groups like, you know, orchestration online or, you know, film scoring practice or whatever it's called. And they have a lot of that, right? A lot of people that have been doing it for a while a lot of people that are just starting and I mean it's like always one of the most common things is your music is fine but it's not telling the story it's not selling the scene and it's almost always because you were thinking about what to write as opposed to like what is the is the story mm-hmm. what is the scene and Berkeley drills that into you like all with all the resources the interviews with like people like Michael Giacchino and Robert Kraft and Thomas Newman like which is just incredible access to to the minds of those people to their professors which are fantastic where they will like drill it into you you know this music is for you it's not for the film because that's the big thing of film scoring is you can't write music for you it always has to be for the film right so berkeley answers some of those easy questions that most people have to learn through trial and error and that depending on who you are it could take a long time and it's a real hard way to look at things like to start thinking about it in that way. Cause you'd think if I'm writing music, I ought to be thinking about the music, right? I mean, that's what I'm writing, but film scoring is the special field in which case that's like completely the opposite because it's not, you're not writing music. You're telling a story with music, right? Which is very different. 
music can tell a story, but what happens if the story comes first and the music comes second? And that's not only are you dealing with that in film scoring, but you're dealing with the picture, right? It's not just the story of like a brief, like a script. It's like, you know, the great tone poems, right? Uh, like Faust was just written off of a sort of a story idea, but he got to take timing. All those uh, things were completely up to the composer. Not so in film scoring, because now you've got a set time. You've got visuals, you have a color palette, you have editing, you have cinematography, you have lighting, you have actors' performance, you have dialogue, like all of those things are doing the same thing. They're all trying to tell their story in their way. Why is there a close up here? Why did the director choose this cut where she sort of trembled her voice or something? Why did the actor choose to tremble their voice? Like, it's all about the story, the sort of, that's the God of film scoring is, it's all servicing there. And they're translating that into their medium and the film scores job, like the great film composers aren't necessarily great composers. They're just incredible linguists. They translate that masterfully, right? And then of course, they're also incredible musicians because then once they translate it to music, their craft starts to speak words. And that's why we remember John Williams tunes and we're always floored by, you know, like the simplicity of Hans Zimmer's music because that translation is there and then they can make good on that translation with their craft. But I believe that it always has to start with the translation and those sort of fundamental things, Berkeley could not not tell you, right? I mean, so many industry professionals have gone through there. So many industry professionals go in there to do clinics and that's like their jobs to educate you on film scoring. So you skip a lot of it, but at the end you, you still start at square one, right? You still start like, do I know any directors? Do any directors know me? Like, and if, and if all you did was go through Berkeley, the answer is probably no, because that all you know, if, if you go through Berkeley, all you know is a bunch of film scoring students all looking for the same director. So it's like, it's not, it doesn't necessarily translate to like, oh, easy money, <laughs> give me the jobs. So do you think uh, for any parents out there listening who has, have a kid that wants to go to Berkeley, should they uh, just invest uh, some money in a little condo in LA and have just have their uh, kid live off that money for a few years and, and try to make connections? You know, honestly, if, if we're, you're talking about like monetary value, if you were to think equivalent, if you were to think like invest $250,000 in an education or invest $250,000 in property in LA, uh, if the kid had the gall to, to, to do the work themselves, right? Because that's the other thing is it, it passively happens in Berkeley. If you make it through Berkeley, you had to have gone through X number of experiences. Recording sessions, deliveries, there's some form of an all-nighter in there somewhere. Like, you know, some level of ludicrous amount of work that you didn't believe was humanly possible and somehow it all got done on time. Like that type of stuff, Berkeley will just sort of do for you if you make it through because you have to rise up to that level to, to get through otherwise you, know, you flunk out. Um, if you can do all that by yourself, which we'll talk about bodybuilding, I'm sure at some point, but that's like the bodybuilders that are just like, you just eat seven meals a day, you just train like, well, not everybody can just do. And I think it's the same way with film scoring. Not everybody can just go out and be super social and network. But if a person were able to do that, I'd say that the money would be better invested in property in LA and equipment, like, because $250,000 can get you quite a lot if we're just thinking the basic mm -hmm. fundamental equivalent costs. Um, not to mention that you could probably do the, the latter, the not Berkeley option for less than $250,000. Like, if you put $10,000 into a rig, right? $10,000 into a computer, keyboard, speakers, interface something like that and like samples 10,000 is a good starting budget for a zero to 100 professional functional rig right I don't think that's a too, totally off bar and saying you could get you could do a lot with 10,000 right there that's half of one semester of Berkeley's tuition okay and, it, and it's not getting paid to your rig so then you talk about what else could you do with property right LA is incredibly expensive everybody knows that but you're talking about uh 1300 for a really good room per month in a good area in santa monica 1500 like how many months can if you take the remaining like two hundred thousand dollars how many months does that do you could you could live in la for four years 
and still not come to cover the cost of Berkeley's education. And, and if you were in there with a professional rig and the individual was able to hone their craft and get out there, you'd probably get more value going that way. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that really picks up on something important, which is kind of the tenacity of each individual, whether you are the type of person that needs to put yourself in the situations that will keep you on track, or you're the type of person who goes out and finds out what they need to know, can incorporate it into their life. And I'm, I think everybody's a mix of these two, right? Like there's no, no doubt. There's always knowledge that I don't possess that will disallow me to progress, right? Until I learn it. It's like thresholds of knowledge you have to get past before you realize, oh, that's what I'm missing. So what do you think, where do you think you are on that spectrum? And if you could kind of assess your, you know, skills, you know, relative to, uh, I suppose, just the general population, what would you say stand out for you? And how does that apply to your career? Well, in the, in the, well, and this is also, this was going to be getting into, you, you asked me about the non-related prompt. I was going to, this ties into what we could talk about more at the end because, um, because the COVID and the lockdown stuff has greatly influenced the way that I work and pursue things and, and all that stuff and, and not in the best way. Um, but as currently I'm like woefully inept at mixing. My mixing is just utterly atrocious by producing is bad. I'm like, I don't think it sounds very good. Maybe to the layman, it's all good. You know, if I show something to my parents, they'd be like, oh my God, wonderful. But, um, but I feel like if I showed it to anybody with any like sort of grit in the, in the industry, it would just be like, you're, you're 50 cents shy of the dollar kid. Um, so, so so that's something that is a huge deficit. Uh, probably of the strengths, though, um, contemporary music, uh, because that was the second major. So not only in the composition major do you learn about composing music, but you get into like post-tonal contemporary music styles of writing, which are, if you're a student of film scoring, it's sad, Berkeley relegates it to a single class post-romantic scoring. But that if you analyze John Williams music, if you look at any of James Newton Howard's music, a lot of the harmony and the orchestrations and the musical ideas are coming from a post-tonal school of thought. They're coming from like Stravinsky, they're coming from Holst, and now Holst wasn't necessarily post-tonal, but Holst was definitely post-functional tonality in the way that you could easily figure out what Beethoven and Mozart were doing from looking at their harmony. Holst and Liszt start muddying the water and paving the way towards what happens when we just get rid of the triad, which is Stravinsky, um, right? So that is something that I like thrive in. Like Jasper and I have done a couple of horror films um, and like the music almost writes itself because that's like my wheelhouse. So I'm able to learn quickly is one of the skills, but also I have this sort of niche for orchestral music and for that sort of aleatoric, atonal, but not so atonal that it just sounds like beeps and bops on like a keyboard, like atonal that it's not tonal, but it, it has a musical shape. Whereas if you look at like pure 12 tone music or like Boulez, it, it sounds like, in my opinion, very contrived and it lacks musicality. So that's a, a realm in which right now I'm very comfortable in. Um, but the production absolutely is the, the, the thing that will kill me if I don't sh shape it up as I'm trying to do. So what do you think the path is to addressing weaknesses? I know we're both early on in our careers, so we can't just 100% know this is exactly what I'm going to do. These are the skills I can avoid and what I can focus on. But I want to kind of dive into your working relationship and how you divvy up projects and why you chose to create a team for scoring. Yeah. So, um, well, I mentioned his name, but I didn't say it for the, for the record. I work with uh, Jasper Van Dyke and we are a writing team. Um, the pairing 
which honestly was like almost everything else so far has been super haphazard in its inception, right? Like the decision to go to Berkeley was based on a Google search of film scoring. And I was like, oh, Berkeley has film scoring? God, God, Berkeley. Like that was it. Um, and the same with the decision to pair up with Jasper. I was like, I love orchestral writing. I love conducting. I, I love that type of scoring. Jasper's like, I love production. I love sound design. I love making drums sound good. And he's like, and I like recording. I'm like, okay, dude, well, we just covered each other's opposite bases, right? And he's like, I don't really know that much about orchestral writing or string arrangements or how to make a string section sound interesting without just writing infinite whole notes with a melody in the violins, right? Like the, the classic string arrangement. Um, so we synergize very well. The, the practicality of that, obviously there are, of the projects we've done, like zero really fit that model where he can just do production and I can kind of just do all the writing and orchestration. So we've had to be very adaptive and the fact that we're very good friends um, and not bad at the other things also helps, right? Like my mixing's not as good as Jasper's, but I can still put something together. His orchestration is, a different style than mine but with bouncing things back and forth internally we can kind of we can kind of create something so the the workflow has been super adaptable and flexible which has been great because we've sort of gotten these wealth of experiences and um, ultimately our vision is the same and I think this is sort of what you're getting at where it's like we want to be passable in everything but exceptional in a few things um, the exceptionals in our case would be different, which is even that you get more value out of out of the pairing, right? If I'm passable at producing, I can make a mock-up. It's not gonna be what's in the film most likely, but I can passably make a mock-up that will stand in terms of the process, getting things through a director. Uh, Jasper can write things down and make a cue. He's not like, oh, what's a note? Like, how do I make music? You know, he's a good writer. But then if we want to talk about making it more lush or something, I can edit. Um, so we're able to function independently during the process. So no one is necessarily waiting for the other person to do something. We can, we can just do it. And then when it comes to the refinement part, we each have a strong set of skills. Jasper can mix all the finished tracks and master them. And it's like, I'm not good at that. If we do recording studios that involve ensembles, I can conduct the whole session, right? I can make all the scores. I make scores really fast. That's another one of the strengths. I'm good at score prep. I can, I can do that type of stuff. So um, the goal is to be passable in everything so that you're not a hindrance to the partner. Because that's the other thing. When working with a partner, they can pick up the slack in the areas that you're woefully inept. Like, I'm not a great mixer, so I said Jasper does all the mixing. But at the same time, if I have to send every single session before it gets to director to him so he can touch it up and make it sound like not crap, like, that's not a good thing, right? Because now I'm not, now I'm just a hindrance. Now he's just doing all the legwork. Um, so that's kind of where the pairing came from was this, we cover each other's bases and we have a natural interest and a natural um inclination towards things that synergize so and then the journey forward becomes just how do you bring up the other things so that we're not like no one's running around with an arrow in their knee mm -hmm. <laughs> a classic the classic. classic yep um cool so i want to go a little bit more into kind of more the uh, personal aspects of working relationships we're both in long-term uh, work partnerships with another person. What qualities of yourself and of Jasper do you think are important? You know, f like for me, I know, you know, responsibility, growth mindset, and just having good communication skills are integral to what my work relationship. What would you say is kind of the core of you and Jasper? Um, there's a couple of things. I would say, and this is the same with every relationship as I've begun to to learn and listen from like i'm i'm not married haven't been married for 30 years but like people that have been married for 30 years will give you one of the uh, same version of this answer and like one of them that ties into everything that you just said is like there needs to be mutual respect there absolutely has to be 
and there has to be humility. Mutual respect and humility get you, I think, they open the door for all the things that you listed to actually be effective. Because if you mutually respect someone and criticize them, um, and they're humble, and you're humble, and you're criticizing and in their reception of it, that is good communication. That paves the way for growth. That paves the way for refinement. If I don't respect you, I'm not going to I'm not going to pull the punches when it comes to saying something. In fact, I might throw the punches in a way that is counterproductive. And if you're on the ropes when receiving something like that, what is the natural human response is to get defensive and getting defensive never helps get move things forward. The defensive literally means I'm digging in, I'm holding my ground. Um, so it's like the dynamic of the personalities and how we think about, communicating and approaching each other has been probably the single most important thing. There are some basic givens when you're trying, when you have high ambitions and lofty goals, there are some things that have to be in place no matter what person I was standing. And those are things like responsibility, accountability, hardworking. If, if he's going to go like fuck off in a corner while I'm working on a project that he should be helping me with, it's like, it's never going to work. If I can't get him anything delivered on time and I'm like, Oh yeah, I'm responsible for one queue this week. I'll get it to you by the end of the week. And it takes three weeks. It's like, dude, what are you doing? How is this possible? So there's, there are some of those things have to be in place. And those are the individuals. Like that's an individual thing. If an individual can't do that, an individual needs to shape up or else it's not going to work on the interactive level. When it's those things are mixing and how are we creating a product and creating a system and, and refining it, it, it's the mutual respect and the humility to be able to, when he digs on my sound or the music or the cue, I cannot take it as an attack on me, right? It, it's, and it's the respect and it's the humility. I'm, it, you have to be humble enough to realize that you're not going to write the perfect cue the first time. And now this is like a no brainer. But you have to, that has to emotionally resonate because we can all intellectually understand that. But the second any director gives you feedback, you feel that <clears throat> tensing happening. And like, that's a natural thing, but you need to condition yourself out of that. Like I need to do it to me. I think, I think Berkeley helps you with that because Berkeley just constantly is giving you feedback for your music. It's, it's hard to, and it's, the feedback is almost never, it's perfect. Don't change anything, right? That's, that is not, that's not the norm. Yeah. So, and we, and we have to be able to do that to each other and we're friends. So we have to have a lot of good faith that when one person is being critical of the other, it is all assumed that this is for the higher purpose for the betterment of both of us. And we can't take anything um, personally. And so you, you then ask yourself, how do you foster that in a relationship? Like, how can you even, how can you get to that point of, of relation with an individual where, you can shit on each other's music all you want in a right in the correct way and nobody gets their feelings hurt and you're constantly moving forward and i would say it comes from how we behave as friends because we're also we're friends so like we have this tradition which are bro nights where we just hang out get drunk do whatever eat some food watch some movies play some games or even just hang out together and there's as i just said get drunk, eat some food, watch some movies. There are costs that are associated with these. And one way that we do it in our friendship is we just let it naturally even out, right? What's more expensive, a Five Guys burger or a bottle of liquor? Obviously the liquor. So if one person buys the bottle, one person covers the food and maybe the movie ticket or something. So it's like, I think to get to that level of friendliness and to get to that level of good faith, it has to be practiced in other aspects of the relationship whether those are other business aspects or whether they're more personal aspects those types of things have to be in because when the defenses start coming up and when people start thinking they're being attacked when hey i think you missed the mark on this cue i think it's still not there um it can start getting intense and that pressure is all it needs to start to like snap things and there's no shortage of examples in history of business partnerships that utterly blew up and failed right like you could think of Wozniak and Jobs um Zuckerberg and the other guy I don't remember his name the like other. the other guy that was played by Andrew Garfield 
way in, in the social network. Uh, I mean, like, it can happen, right? Things can totally blow up. So I think that we try to keep a good faith and the idea that we're oriented towards not each other. We're oriented towards the film, towards the vision. If I'm telling you something, it's to serve that it's not to serve my ego it's not to take yours down it's all about serving this and that has to be reciprocated right because it's a two-way street yeah no definitely i think um also assessing you know making sure you guys have the same goal right that you're on the same path and you're not like you know unspokenly in two different directions that seem yes. line at the moment um so i'm interested in these goals but i'm i think i'm more interested in the values, the personal values behind these goals that create the goals. So if you were to look back and say you lived your life well, what would that look like? What kind of values do you think you want to incorporate into everything you do? And this is another way in which Jasper and I work well because our, our goals are pretty, our values are pretty much mutually aligned, which I think that's one thing. If, if there's a fundamental value miss misalignment that that becomes hard right like that's like the basic value of someone who believes in accountability and someone who's like eh, it's fine right like that's you guys are going to be missing the mark with each other the values that i tend to orient myself around and if we talk about the life the life trajectory it's always been um like did i leave things better than i found them did i move things forward in a positive way have i made more right in what could have been a wrong um you know there's as we progress people have to pave the way um like not to get overly political i just think it's an easy example to make and it's relevant to the time right now like a lot of people will say that you know the the feminists of the 70s or of the original suffrage movement are not as good as they could have been because they focused on white women and not all women. And it's like, this is a fair criticism. They, they focus on themselves. But they also paved the way for society to start entertaining the idea that women are autonomous individuals. And if now the next level can, it's not fair that they didn't happen at the same time. It's not fair, right? That's not cool. But if the next generation could take it up as their responsibility to, let's move the needle in the next way let's make this even more right instead of crapping on who paved the way before you but also acknowledging that like we're all imperfect if i move the needle forward like jasper and i want to correct some wrongs that we see in the entertainment industry particularly with regards to crediting media composers um in 50 years 60 years if we somehow revolutionize this system, there will somehow still be a stone we missed and there will be a disenfranchised party that is not being respected or credited properly or taken care of. And that will be up to the next people to solve. And I only hope that they don't look at us as monsters for not having thought of everything, right? So that's kind of the way I try to orient myself. Like, look what's happening, try to make it, try to make it better try to do right by people and not be like an overt dickhead. Like um, I'm trying, it's hard in business and especially in the entertainment industry to move forward without being some, like without stepping on some fingers or at the, or at the worst case scenario, like stabbing some backs, you know, um, we're trying to avoid that. But the, the goal is to leave it better than we found it type thing. Yeah, that makes sense. Part of what I want to get at, on this channel is really the like kind of personal life stuff too and how being a composer interacts with your personal life your health your well-being uh, just basically what is you know the sacrifices everything like that so how would you say going into a career in composition and film scoring has affected decisions in your personal life and what are the sacrifices you've made to pursue this well it because of how strenuous it is and because of how competitive of an industry it is, um, it's one of those things where for me, I've had to put that goal in front of almost everything else. Um, I would say you want 
to avoid putting it before things like basic health and well-being. But at some times, that also, it, it wins out. Not necessarily consistently, but if we think it's not good to not sleep, right? It's, it's bad for you. But I've not slept to get things done. So it's like there's a degree of it has to, for me, it, I have to put it before everything else at moments. Now, I try to balance that and not always orient it ahead of everything else. And maybe, maybe Jasper and I will woefully fail in our goals, and that will be why, because we wouldn't sacrifice everything um, for it. Uh, that, that's a tale that time will determine. But um, it, it definitely is something that if you want to take it seriously, as, um, as I've decided is going to be my path, there absolutely have to be concessions made with regards to social time, with regards to relationships, especially like long-term ones um, of the partner spouse variety. You know, if, if you want to take that seriously, the relationship and the career, those have to be reconciled in some way. And if the career goals, right, like if we think of a relationship goal as marriage and children, if we just think of like that as what you would orient yourself towards marriage, children, and sustenance. Sustenance meaning that you don't get divorced. Um, that is not the most lofty thing in the world. It's, I think, the loftiest you could get with regards to a relationship. It's the, it's the ideal. But in terms of like changing the world, it, it's much easier. Uh, it's much harder to try to like get into an industry and dominate it to the point where you could make some form of structural surgery that betters it. So if you're looking at then which goal is going to come first in the general priority scheme, it's like you're going to, I find that the relationship oftentimes plays second fiddle to the career goal. Um, and that's a decision that I've made and that I'm happy living with because you, you can't have everything, right? You have to pick. That's what I've picked. And I, uh, with, I'm with someone that is on the same page, which is very important because if they weren't, it wouldn't work. Um, so that, that's something that if you have lofty goals of media composition, which you don't need one either, right? If we talk about the big goal, well, the, the littler goal could have been, I just want to make a living writing music for media. That's like a much more doable goal with maintaining other things, high priority in your life. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're okay, having a second job, a normal job, and just doing some media composing on the side and making extra money that way, which there is absolutely nothing wrong with, and it's a great live uh, lifestyle, then you, you obviously are not going to have to go quite as hard and sacrifice as much with regards to priorities and how much of your resources being your attention, you know, your literal waking energy uh, you can, you can give more to other things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a good way to put it. Um, one of the things that I'm really trying to experiment with and have been for years now, and I know you have too, kind of from our background with, uh, bodybuilding and, you know, lifting and stuff like that is what that day to day looks like and how mastering your body's rhythm and just understanding how human psychology and physiology works in order to get the most out of all of these things and potentially have more attention energy while still getting more sleep um so that's one of the that's kind of my goal with this channel is to actually ask the questions that could make us think maybe i shouldn't stay up editing videos till 8 a.m every morning you know, because then I don't get started working till 8 p.m. the next day. Maybe there's a better way to do this. So, um, so for example, for me, I know I write best in the mornings. The second I get out of bed, have my coffee, and start writing, right? That goes for both video outlines, essay type things, and music. And I edit best at night if there's like a certain focus I get. And then if I try to work during those middle hours of the day, I'm useless. And I've learned for me that that's the time that it's optimal for me to put in my exercise, meditation, you know, family time. Um, I don't really have any entertainment anymore. That's kind of one of the things I cut. But, <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's the other stuff, errands, because I don't have those 
connections firing in my brain to produce good quality content. But that came as a realization. And if I had kept trying to force it, like I was for years, like 4 PM, oh, I just got to keep working. And I write, you know, 20 notes in two hours. That was not well spent. And that could have been two hours of napping that would have, you know, increased my productivity afterwards by two times or going to the gym and uh, increasing my health level, basically. So are there any of these type of trends that you've noticed for yourself? And are there any kind of, I hate the term, but like life hacks that you've found that you've been able to apply to yourself and might be able to extrapolate to, you know, others? Yeah, no, it's, it's hard right now. I'm actually in like a complete lull, which I need to kind of get myself out of. I've, I've noticed that I was running on sort of fumes for a while with, um, with regards to the kind of Corona stuff and the lockdowns, like not fumes, uh, inertia. I had so much going on and was like on top of it, moving, getting things done that it sort of kept going, but was slowing down as if you not, you don't hit the brakes, but you just let up off the gas. And now I've kind of hit the part where it's like, I've stalled out. So I'm trying to find scheduling and a way to get back on, um, on top of it with regards to like the, the fitness and some of the overall well-being with nutrition. Right now I'm in between places. I'm going to be moving to LA in literally a few weeks if everything goes through the way I'm expecting it to. So that's been a big kind of thing right now. But um, it's, I guess I could think of it with Berkeley. I can, I can speak more definitively with Berkeley and this is what I'm trying to recultivate because at Berkeley, I did, um, and, and you did one, I believe, also during your time at Berkeley, like a bodybuilding show, which is if we look at what it takes to successfully compete in a bodybuilding show, not necessarily win, but just like, what are the things that you need to focus on with that goal in mind? You need to focus on your nutrition. Now, it's a different kind of nutrition than just normal healthy nutrition, right? It's a very specific nutrition that's designed to cut fat. But, but that's in the forefront is nutrition, a more rigorous version than most people would have to go through. You have to focus on obviously your training, but then you have to focus just as much as you do on your training. Um, and obviously Christian was real big on this. You have to focus on your recovery because uh, recovery is very important. And what does recovery look like for bodybuilding? Ideally, it looks like low stress and lots of sleep. That's recovery for bodybuilding, right? Just chilled out, get sleep, do you, do you train in, eat your chicken and like, yeah, I'm happy. Like that is optimal for your body. Um, so if we, if you put that in and then you juxtapose that with concurrently working through Berkeley and getting closer to finals week, I believe that the bodybuilding competition ran me right up to finals week. The last week of the show was like the week before school ended or the, the Saturday of the show was like, right before the last week or two. So, I mean, which is anybody that's gone to Berkeley knows that the last two weeks are absolutely chaos. It's the hardest two weeks you'll live in your life at that point. So what does that come with? Like a lot of stress, it comes with a need for your time. You are tempted to, I want to stay up late and do these projects because I need to do them. And, um, and an absolute bottoming out of your nutrition because you're just like, I'm just going to get Wendy's and then that'll be it. And, yeah. and then I'll wake up and not eat until 10 PM the next day. And then I'm going to go get Chinese food. It's like, there is a way to put those two together. And it's what I found. I've, I've coached a lot of people in weight loss and lifting um, a lot of people older than me, some people my age, but one of the things that I find to be like the life hack is you have to have confidence. And if you break down the word confidence, I don't know if you enjoy this, Alex, but I sometimes enjoy breaking down where words come from to find out sort of what they really mean beyond just the cultural understanding of confidence. Like most people think confidence, they think like confident, but confidence when you break it down means con with fidence faith. It means with faith. So confidence is not actually about knowing it's not about understanding and having a guarantee. Confidence is about going out on a limb and hoping for the best, right? That is what the word really comes from. So 
there needs to be a degree of confidence that you can do some of these things and not have it hurt your other pursuit. So in this case, we relegate health with work, which is usually the classic one, right? Health, work, and family are like the triage of, of um, life. If we are trying to balance health and work, we need to have the confidence that because as we just said, those two things can feel diametrically opposed. Like when I'm prioritizing work, I've got to get rid of nutrition. I've got to get rid of sleep. When I'm prioritizing health, I've got to get my nutrition. I've got to get my sleep. How can those two things exist? And that's where the confidence comes in because as you said, they can actually enhance one another. You might feel like I need 12 hours to work on this because this is what I need to get done. I need to do it in 12 hours. So I don't have time to cook. I don't have time to train. Um, I, I don't have any other time because I need these 12 hours. Well, maybe you only need those 12 hours because your energy levels are not optimized. You're trying to focus for 12 hours, which means your work per hour is going to be slowly degrading over that time because that's just too long to be focused on something. Maybe you could actually get out of two three-hour sessions, which is still 50% of the time you initially wanted to put in, more value and more productivity if you align those other parts. And that's where the with faith comes in because you have this, this internal feeling. I need this time. I need 12 hours. I can't get it done. I can't get it. I, I need this time. No, leave me alone. Sorry. No, I'll, I'll eat later. Like, I'll sleep tomorrow. That kind of stuff. Uh, if you get the rest of the things ticked up, if you get the health, if you get some good fuel in your body, some good nutrition, if you get some good energy, some good hormones, some mental clarity from going on a run in the sun and sitting for 15 minutes in the park with your eyes closed, listening um, to the sounds around you, right? And trying to be mindful. You might find that your productivity skyrockets and you didn't actually need those 12 hours. What you needed was three good hours twice a day. So, and that comes from, there is no way to prove that. There's no way to get someone to inherently feel that that will work if they're not living that life already. So I think that the, with faith, the confidence is the number one thing to just go out on a limb, give it a go and see how it works. And you and I have both experienced that it, it does do that, right? You just said, that four hour or that middling hours, I'm useless. I should do other things. And it makes the other hours productive. Um, we didn't initially speak about it or I didn't, I wasn't thinking about it when I said it, but you and I both came to the same conclusion of split it up. Uh, do something in the morning, do something later. Mm -hmm. Don't sit in front of a screen for eight hours grinding away at it um, in your normal life, right? Obviously there are moments when if you've got a big recording session and you're trying to make scores and all this stuff, there are crunch times when everything has to go bottom out for this one thing. But very quickly after that, I want to bring it back to normal, right? Yeah. Do you think you can, um, I have my own opinions on this, but do you think you could kind of build up your health going into a project to give it a higher level from which to deteriorate? <laughs> you know that, I mean, it makes sense you, that you could do it. I, other, other places do that, right? Well, I mean, you go in with some degree of overpreparedness, knowing that the process will be difficult. And I, at the very least, even if it was just theoretical, you're gonna, well, you're always better off being healthy. So it's like, even if you're getting healthy for a project, just to eventually get unhealthy when the project concludes, at least you're getting healthy for some part of your life. So it's like, it's still not bad. But I, I think that that actually could be it's, it's hard to perceive um, difference in focus and energy levels, right? Because you, you live in a flow state constantly. So, and what, and if you've ever had a pet or seen things grow and change over time, you, you will know that when it's in the thick of it, changes are not noticed, right? I had a, I had a big dog. He was like 98 pounds when he was full grown adult for most of his life. We got him. He was about this big. He was a little tiny puppy. Um, I never noticed him growing. And it's like, you look at the pictures, you're like, obviously, I know he grew. He is massive. And he was not. He was a baby. So clearly, growing happened. But you don't perceive it because it's happening right there. Same with like weight loss, right? A lot of weight loss 
is hard to notice in the moment. So I think the same with energy levels. It's hard to imagine and conceive of what you could be like with more energy because you just live in the you that is you. And if your energy was built up, it was done over time. If your energy deteriorated, it was done over time, which makes it very hard to think of a situation, a, a new energy level in the current context that you could realistically have. So it, it's hard to conceptualize that as the individual. And that's why I go back to the confidence that I think that we know for a fact that energy levels can be optimized. We know with better sleep and better nutrition and like hit your macros and hit your micronutrients and like eat things that are green. Like we know for a fact that people feel better, are happier, have more energy. They're more productive with the time they do spend working and their discipline is almost comes from a positive inertia that's like, oh man, let's keep this going. I'm killing it right now. I'm feeling great. Let's do it. So I think that it would be wise for us to at the very least front load it and get that sort of mindset. Try to build into that mindset. It's hard to build that up while you're already in the trenches. So like build it up when you're not in the trenches and then try your best. I think more often than not, we actually could keep it going. Mm -hmm. um, during a project. Maybe uh, when I think of a crunch time, I think of like a few nights, maximum a week out of the project that would actually need to be an all hands on deck thing. I don't think as humans or in, and as professionals, we give ourselves enough credit. There's this romanticization of sacrificing your body for the project that we all sort of, you know this at Berkeley, dude, right? It's a badge of honor how few hours you've slept. Exactly. Oh, I'm on my fifth cup of coffee because I've been awake for 86 hours straight. It's like, that's not good. Don't do that. <laughs> stop, stop doing it. You, you don't need to. I promise you don't need to. They're like, it took me eight hours to write this paper. It was so hard. I'm like, it took you eight hours because your body's in the crapper. Okay. Yeah. Watch a movie, go to sleep. You'll write it in two the next day. Kind of thing. So I, I think we need to spend more energy, myself included, cultivating health through work not just in anticipation of work, although if it deteriorates in anticipation, it's the best you can do. If it goes down, it's very hard to bring it back up in the thick of it. The best that you can do is sort of orient yourself towards a reset, in which case I think it's irresponsible not to get your health back once the excuse goes right, right? Everyone has the same excuse. It's finals week. Okay, well, it's not finals week anymore. Go to the gym, eat, eat spinach, like, you know? Um, but I, I think at the same time, it doesn't have to be this sort of deterioration. I almost think it can be maintained with maybe little divots when things get really intense and it really is, I have a deadline. Things just got changed. We just lost our recording booking and I've got to recontract all new players. Everybody got COVID. Okay. Like somehow there's going to be a moment where it gets intense, but I don't think it has to be this sort of prep for a inevitable decline i think as as composers we could do a much better job of creating a culture that incentivizes and i think it's very possible more maintenance of actual health instead of just being these workhorses that slave in front of a computer next to a keyboard for directors and producers like you know 13 hours a day to come up with six minutes of music like i don't think that's the culture that we need to to create i think it's it's exciting and there's a degree of satisfaction that comes from like doing that type of suffering right there there is a degree throughout history and throughout our mythology as humans that suffering is is good like it's everywhere in biblical mythologies but it's even in here right like just talked about the berkeley thing oh i stayed up all night i haven't even gone to sleep it's it's like this positive thing that i'm putting myself on the chopping block for something else I don't think it needs to be that way. And I think part of the reason is, is because it is easier to do that than it is to maintain the health. But I think the other part of it is that that has become sort of the standard and glorified. So people find no problem fitting into that category when I think as a community, we should all be aiming for this one. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And I want to encourage people if I'm, I'm guessing most people haven't, if you're a composer, but check out the book Deep Work by Cal Newport. This, it really goes into how much more efficient we can be with each hour we work and how to optimize that, the science behind it. 
And I'm really trying to live my own theory, which is you can live a balanced life if you live it intelligently and mindfully and gather like information, knowledge, gather data about your own self. I try to track everything I do in terms of every 30 minute block of the day that I'm doing, I try to track what I'm doing. So I'm not like, wow, I worked so much this week. And then I look back and it was like 20 hours, you know, and to start taking account of even, even my sleep, for example, I track my sleep. I put in every different factor. Like, did I drink alcohol? Did I work out? Did I meditate before bed? Did I read before bed? And it gathers all this data and gives me, you slept 10% better when you worked out 30 minutes before bed and took a bath before bed. So I'm like, okay, so those are two things that I now can know. I'm going to put those right before bed because I sleep with 10% better. And it measures that through, you know, sleep cycles is as accurate as that can be. Are you tracking through an app, spreadsheet, uh, journal? It's called, um, let me see. It's called Pillow. Pillow. You can create custom uh, inputs, you know, about or, or criteria that it tracks. And then it gives you uh, a map or a, you know, plus percentage or minus percentage of your overall sleep. And I've been tracking it for um, since the new year. And just for, so I can give you some, some examples in how significant some of these things are. And it gets more, more uh, accurate over time. You know, the more data we have, the more accurate. So, yeah. so for example, I'm going to go to um, my sleep notes, they're called. So when I meditated before bed, I had an average of a 7% increase in sleep quality. When I took a bath before bed, I also had a 7% increase. Worked out late. You get in the bathtub. Yep. <laughs> when I worked out late, 4% increase. Um, it says night out drinking a positive 3%, but I think that's because I only put that in once and I slept in until like noon. So it, it, I don't think it quite tracked that accurately. And then I had negative percentages when I ate late and watched TV before bed. So these are things that probably are intuitive, but when you have data to back that up, it helps to be like, okay, I'm going to not have a snack right before bed and I'm going to get off the TV and I'm going to meditate because if I can optimize this, if I can get my sleep quality up to like 90%, you know, where my sleep cycles are flowing, I'm not waking up during the night, not sweating profusely during the night. That's just more efficient sleep and that's just better right if we can do everything in our life more efficiently and understand how to do so and how our bodies work doing that that just gained time that's gained quality and you know i could sleep for seven hours but if it's like 90 percent efficiency there's there's no more not efficiency 90 percent quality like there's no more benefit i'm going to get to sleeping anymore right and and kind of to what you're saying there's a culture of wow, I only slept one hour and it was like, wow, I was, I passed out on the toilet. You know what I mean? Cause that's all I had. And, you know, I work 24 hour days for a week straight. And like, in, in some ways, I think this is because people at the bottom get screwed, right? People at the bottom of the food chain, they, some exec makes a decision and they just cause why not, you know, sounds good. Let's push the date a week ahead. Yeah, that sounds good. And then the people at the bottom are Okay, that's they catch it. Exactly. Because <laughs> so, it goes through every, all the layers and they're like, okay, it's a week later. So you got that composer? Like, where's like, okay, yeah, it's a week later. You got that assistant. The assistant's like, what? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and this sleep is just one example of how I think these um, patterns can really increase the efficiency. And it's almost like the working smarter and, and harder because you're allowed to work harder. It's, it's kind of the same thing about people who take steroids, right? It allows them to work harder. So that's, it allows them to recover and do it again and do it more efficiently and get it done better and then recover and do it again and again and again. And that adds up over time into significantly increased gains rates. I don't know what the, I don't think it's exponential, but it's, it, you know, it's accum accumulates. And another example of this, for example, is studying there's a lot of research around retained um, information and knowledge if you exercise right after studying. So if I, my theory is that if I line these things up and continue learning as much as possible, 
I'll be able to get as much quality work done over the next 30 years as somebody doing it the standard way. And I don't know if this will work, but I'm going to give it a try because my top value in my life is balance, you know, and that's not something I'm willing to sacrifice for in perpetuity for success. Beautiful. Yeah. It, it rings, it rings true, right? Like you can think of so many examples of, of like moments. I, at least I can think of a lot of examples of moments in my life when I felt like I was very, very busy or like, Oh, how did I do that? But it, it came down to the optimization. We always have the same 24 hours of the day. How do you optimize it? How do you spend it? Um, Christian was big on the data and the data is useful for more than just bodybuilding, right? Because tracking things makes such a difference in just keeping you accountable, right? We, so to talk about the human psychology aspect, because you mentioned that, right? Well, we are so in, we're so incredible as human beings at BSing ourselves and rationalizing actions and filtering out to create favorable narratives in our mind. Like I worked so hard. It's like, dude, you, you sat in front of a computer and looked at Facebook so hard. Like, but we're able to create the narrative. And I mean, this is a bleak, this is a bleak example, but it, I, it really holds true. A man was able to rationalize the systematic slaughtering of a group of people. Groups of people have been able to rationalize the systematic enslavement of another group of people based on the most arbitrary factors we could possibly think of. But they rationalized them to be very profound differences that made this okay. Like, and you, you can laugh at it, right? We can all laugh at all. That's stupid, of course. But this was real. And this is what the human brain is capable of doing if you don't keep it in check. And on a lesser degree, a much less, you know, globally disastrous degree. It does this for us with our work and our sleep. Oh, I'm getting fine sleep. It's just blah, 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 blah. Are you getting fine sleep? Probably not. But if you don't have data that just shows you money is the easiest example. Oh my God, money is easy. Oh, I'm so broke. I never have enough money. Like, how many times have you gotten Starbucks this week? How many things have you bought? And well, I just, I had such a hard work. I needed to treat myself like, yeah, okay, you did that there. But then there and there and there and there, like, you're not broke. You're just bad with money. You're just not tracking it. You're, you're creating a narrative that says, I'm not spending money. I'm only spending what I need to spend. And your body has rationalized what its needs are. You need that Starbucks. Probably not. Get a Keurig. Like, you don't need it kind of stuff. Um, so the psychology of how we rationalize things is, I think, paramount in at least just being able to kind of start. A uh, Christian was also being on the monster, right? You guys went over the monster. You know, the monster is whatever part of you is counter to your goals, the the lazy tendencies or the rationalizing tendencies where you logically work your way out of every bad thing you do or every not optimal thing. Understanding that that is something your brain will naturally do and putting things in place to check it. It's not just, it's not enough to check it yourself because it, it's like saying the government is woefully inept at something. Let's have the government solve the problem. Like you're, you're giving the solutions work to the malfunctioning entity. It's not intelligent. So when you know, Oh, my brain messes with me. It's going to paint a picture that's not actually true and it's not going to give me an accurate data system to to course correct. Let me just be aware of that and try to track it with my brain. Like no. It's not going to work, dude, because it's you're giving it to the same corrupt little ding dong. Put it in a spreadsheet. Put it in an app. Be honest in the moment. It's easy to be honest in the moment because you're in the moment. You can say, okay, I looked at my phone at 1230 and I didn't stop looking away from it until one. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's a half an hour I spent on YouTube. What was I watching? It wasn't productive. It was not an informational video. It was like highlights from a basketball game five years ago. Yeah. Like that I've seen six times. You know, it, it, you start tracking that and then you can look at the aggregate over the week, right? Like, man, I just, 
I didn't get a lot done. This week was hard. I didn't, I just, my mind wasn't there. I wasn't focusing. You, those are all the easy excuses. Like, oh, it's just rough. Like, look, look at it. You stayed up late eating snacks. Your sleep suffered because of that. You didn't start working until nearly five hours after you woke up. And even then, when you were working, you took a lot of phone breaks um, to the point where you never even really sat down for more than a cumulative 30 minutes at a time to actually work. It's like, of course, your focus was bad because you never even focused once. You know, it's like that paints such a different picture than the sort of the brain's synopsis, spark notes, rationale that always puts you at the forefront, right? It's because you're always the protagonist of your story. So my brain is always going to make the outcome favorable to me. And one of the great challenges and data helps this very much is just being able to self-assess and figure out like, how did I just absolutely utterly fail? Yeah, exactly. And the other part I feel like is having the right people around you, the right community, you know, supportive people who have your best interest in mind, you know, how would, do you have a community of people around you? Obviously you have Jasper, me, stuff like that. Um, maybe I'm not a good influence, but um, how do you create and cultivate a community of people who are like-minded, but also have qualities that you want to learn from and are, um, you know, able to be honest with you. But I also am somebody who wants to be careful of having too much input that's irrelevant or wrong, right? Because I think that's where a lot of, you know, growth and becoming more professional and older comes into play. You start to be able to um, categorize criticism, feedback, other people's input as not aligned with your goals. Maybe that works for them, but irrelevant to me. And kind of creating that filter is really important and having it be a good filter for you and not for somebody else. So how do you create that community, especially if you're somebody, if you're listening and you don't feel like you have that, you feel like you're kind of alone in it, the people around you, you don't really want to show them stuff because they're kind of like, you know, well, that's cool, but like, what's that? What are you ever going to do with that? You know? Oh, well, I think one thing on what you just said, there's also the danger of, um, of over filtering, right? And getting to the point where you, you stop filtering out valid feedback or you start filtering out valid feedback because you start getting this like weird self preservation attitude where it's like, like there might be some feedback that's totally not relevant and it's like okay but that wasn't the point so your advice is taken and we'll just put it right here versus someone who actually kind of had a good point you're like well and you have like the same response so i think that's just an internal check to try to put up against that type of stuff um, for me with cultivating it i like environmental stimulus like i have d discovered that in a vacuum I run out of gas very fast. Like if I'm left alone just to do my own thing, if I'm not in a community of people that are actively like kicking ass and taking names, I will run out of that gas and acclimate very quickly. And now I think that's most people. Most people we're very, that's the whole point of what you just said is understanding that as humans, we are susceptible to our environment. So it is natural that that'll happen. Um, but then you ask, I think we always have to ask ourselves, and this is the same with relationships, like what do I actually need? Do I need people to influence me? Or do I need a culture to influence me? Do I need an environment to influence me? Um, and for me personally, because I, I can only speak about what actually helped me, is um, it was Berkeley and it's the environment. It's less about people. Um, because I'm in a rut right now and it's, it's nothing to do with the people because I have great people. It's just like the environment here is slow. It's chilled. And a lot of this is, is because of COVID. This, that was, uh, that it keeps tying into that for my situation. So I'm trying to kind of find a way to push back against what has been the biggest help for me has been an environment of hard work. Berkeley was great for me and the next level program was great not because I had lots of great critical feedback from friends at Berkeley and not because you know you and Corey and Christian and everybody could critique my program it was because the general attitude was it's hard 
there are hard challenges and you get it done. And that for me, I can almost infinitely keep myself up to a very difficult challenge in a difficult culture. The second that environment gets taken away, it's like, yeah, right back down. So for me, it's, it's not even just about creating a community of people. It's really putting myself in an environment where the standard is excellence and the pressure is high. That was how I interpreted Berkeley. And now we can talk about the negatives of Berkeley's culture and no doubt there are similarities with other cultures with like the glorifying of sacrificing one's body for the sake of project kind of thing. But just the overall environment of it is so rigorously hard and there's, there's only one option, which is to just go and do it. That gets me to just go and do it. And I can keep myself at a much higher working capacity than if I'm in some other place, which is one of the reasons why I'm really looking forward to getting out to LA because that's one of the dominant like vibes of LA. It's just you, you, everybody's going after it. Everybody's talented. If you're not going after it, you're going to get, you get priced out very quickly because you just, you lose out on it. Um, it. It's tricky to try to cultivate that. For me personally, it's dependent upon the environment. So I kind of follow it. Um, for other people, if it's a communal thing, it's like, I guess, and we talked about this a little bit, like setting up meetings. Like there's nothing wrong with setting up meetings. There's nothing wrong with setting up Zoom calls with Zoom conferences with like four or five people once a week to go over the data that you might have accrued, right? Take the data model, start accruing data, get four other people to start accruing data. It doesn't matter where they are. Virtual hangouts are a thing, you know, once a week, everybody checks in for a weekly recap and you just honestly and it goes back to the partnership what makes a good partnership mutual respect and humility nobody's judging each other we're all just looking i slept horribly why did you sleep horribly chad well it was all my own stupid fault i started watching some show and i just stayed up way too late watching it it's like and everybody can give their feedback and advice and create a sort of sustainable bubble battery type thing that encourages moving forward one of the great flaws of the bodybuilding culture, and this, this mindset permeates other things, but it's very easy to notice in the bodybuilding culture is this idea of like the one man army, right? Like you just do it. Nobody ever tells me to go to the gym. You think I need to be told to go to the gym? No, I just do it. It's like- Rest days, that's the worst. Rest days, no. Why do we need rest days? Like, I want to be working all the time. Like, that person does not really exist. That person is not real. And even the people that are that person, if that's just who they are on social media, if you were to look at the myriad of environmental and financial factors that were keeping them at that level, it's obvious you've got to go to the gym every day. Your entire brand is built on it. Mm -hmm. We do the things that our brand is built on. If your brand is built on being a reliable worker that goes to their nine to five job, guess what you do? You go to your nine to five job. Nobody gives you any perks. You're even there for eight hours. This bodybuilder's only there for two. He's got it easy, you know? So it's like that idea of like, you can just do it is not helpful. And I think if we stop focusing on like making us like, forcing ourselves to be this battery that is self-sustaining and putting that same effort to just cultivating the smallest amount of community even if it's a weekly call or a bi-weekly call a fucking monthly call like it could be anything mm -hmm. um, i think we would find that we get a lot from from that in the ways of community and the ripple effects that were sort or the proxy effects that we're all trying to feel that we, we know that i can be better if I put myself in this sort of environment that encourages it. Yeah, totally. I think um, you brought up a good point about like having these meetings, for example, focus as check-ins for yourself and your own progress, but also social time. And that brings up for me the idea kind of of dual purpose activities, right? So I, for example, I, like I said earlier, I don't really have any traditional forms of entertainment that aren't dual purpose. Right. So if I watch Netflix or a movie, it's really fulfilling my need for like family time, you know, with my girlfriend and our dog, you know, that's what the need is fulfilling. And secondary, I get to watch a cool show, you know. Um, but I think this also, 
I'm able to harness that for the rhythm of my day, which I'm actually going to be making a video about soon. Um, and we talked about this earlier, you know, writing best in the morning, like editing at night for me. But there's certain things that fulfill multiple needs, right? Like um, going on a walk while listening to an orchestration podcast, right? I'm learning and internalizing while walking my dog. Um, and there's so many things that I'm able to do this, you know, getting my entertainment while watching an instructional video, you know, for mock-ups, right? I still get enjoyment out of that. And it still is a relief from me having to do anything. I can just sit and absorb. And that's kind of how I've come to this YouTube channel in part is I needed a different project to work on that I could intersperse between writing and working on music because I was getting, I was getting burnt out, you know, just wake up, write, go to sleep, you know, after wake up again, write, work all night. And it, even though it's like the primary thing I love doing, it gets old, but is, you know, I could have just stopped and been like, I'm going to take more entertainment time, but I found another outlet where I'm like, this fulfills that need. I'm loving video editing. I'm liking writing. I'm liking outlining and producing stuff. It's hitting a different, you know, dopamine center in my head, which is the part that's lacking with the music. So I found a way to make both of these times productive and still fulfill my needs as a person to not go crazy. Well, what you're talking about there is it's just an extension of the, of the theme that we've been going over for the last like 15 minutes. It's further optimizing, right? Be strategic, be intelligent and intelligible in the way that you orient your life. And it's difficult. It's a motherfucker. I struggle with it. But I think the first step, and I, I personally believe this, but I think the first step into making anything better is always at least trying. Like if you Let's say, um, I, I also very fundamentally believe that we're all nightmares to be around, that every single person has something, some facet about them that is like in any circumstance could just be a deal breaker. And that the vast majority of our relationships exist on the sort of good faith, you know, I'll give them some slack, always oh, going on another rant. Well, you know, like that type of stuff. I think we all have something like that where it's like you are unbearable as a human being. Uh, the first step to even becoming bearable is like the self-assessment acknowledging like, oh my God, I, I do this to people. Oh my God, and they deal with it? Wow, why? Why on earth would someone put up with that crap? I wouldn't, you know? And it's, it's the same with th this type of thing with optimization. Like it's the first step is just realizing that there is change to be made that could be beneficial. And then, over time, you can get more hands-on with how you implement it. You can get more refined. Um, and in the beginning, everybody's going to structure it differently, right? No, and this is to relate it to film scoring and media composition. No two templates are the same. Everybody needs a template, right? Everybody needs a template, but no one's templates are the same. No one sets it up exactly the same way. There are themes. Okay, you're almost no one is going to put their reverbs on every track. All right, we're going to use sends. Okay, fair enough. Uh, but how everything else is set up, articulations, expression maps, tracks, key switches, you know, libraries, how do you organize it? You organize it by instrument, you organize it by brand. Like all those things are going to be your deal. How many group tracks do you have? How many stems, stripes, blah, blah, blah. Um, it's all going to be different. And when I think of it like optimizing your life, it's like the same thing what you so said some things that are dual purpose for you exercise peace of mind health vitamin d and knowledge all kind of come into and taking care of your dog all fit into one activity and listen to something learn i can get my son my vitamin d i can feel good about walking i can get some fresh air and hey i'm taking care of this little guy um all at once you don't have a dog that you can't do that right but we can all find ways in which we can optimize our time like so i love gaming um gaming by itself is just on paper not a great use of time i want to get better at a game oh well why are you going to be a pro at it no then why are you working on getting better at it i want to blah 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 like whatever it is so you have to find ways 
in which these things can be beneficial. And now I don't think that there always has to be a positive to something. I think it's okay for something to just be a fuck it moment, right? Like going out drinking with your buddies doesn't need some auxiliary thing it's helping you with. Sometimes you can just have a night with the boys kind of thing. So, but I think if we're talking about optimization, finding the ways in which other things can be made to be dual functioning is, is like paramount in terms of getting the balance and getting all those things in together, right? There's not enough time to do everything on its own and give it the time of day and have the focus and the clarity and all that stuff. But to find ways in which some of those things can link up, then you can at least feel good about the times when you do screw off. And so I'll, I'll put it into a fitness perspective. I had, um, I followed a, a nutrition plan, which I was trying out to see how it worked for weight loss or for fat loss rather. And, um, the whole thing was structured around just low calorie. It was like, eat whatever you want, but you rigorously track the calories. And the second you hit the number, you're done for the day. Um, it had an element of freedom because you could, you, you can't just eat whatever, even if it's hitting the calories forever. Like even you could, that's like the Pop-Tart diet or the Twinkie diet, right? It's like, oh, I just eat five Twinkies a day and I'm eating Twinkies, but I'm losing weight. It's like not healthy. It's not going to work. But if you had like a pretty good week and one of those days, you're like, you know what? Most of my calories are coming from one slice of pizza and I'm just not going to eat very much and I'm going to enjoy this pizza. You can still feel good about it because it's still servicing the goal. And then there was like, you know, the refeed day where you have like a very high calorie day and you can feel good about eating whatever because you're like, this is part of the program. So if you structure your life to make it so that the things that would traditionally be considered time wastes, if you make that part of the program, do you feel good about it? If I make my video gaming time part of the program as a time to just be a reward for getting the first eight hours of my day correct, you woke up, you had breakfast, you, you did some meditation, you did some journaling, you wrote some music, you went to the gym, you walked Teddy. It's like, I now totally can spend an hour of time and feel perfectly good about it. It doesn't matter what I do with this hour. I could freaking stare at leaves for this hour. And it's like, but I mean, it's going to be productive. It's going to be good for me to just do whatever I want to do. because I've been on it with the rest of this. And chances are, if you've built up that kind of inertia, from my experience, if I build up that kind of inertia in my day, going to the video games is not going to be the thing that ruins my day because it's going to be this, it's part of the program. It's, I'm not pushing pause. I'm shifting gears. And then I'm going to reshift gears at the end of the hour. If I've had this banger of a day and I'm like, I just need a quick little video game break. And then we're going to get back into it. Chances are, I'm not going to derail during the video game break and suddenly spend another eight hours gaming and like, oh no, what happened? I'm going to be like, all right, time's up. We spent about an hour and 15 on the video games. Let's uh, get back to the mix. Let's get back to something else. Let's meal prep for tonight. Like, you know, something like that. The productivity begets productivity. So if you set up yourself to where everything is part of the program, including Netflix time, video game time, watching YouTube time, if you find a way to orient it so those are part of the program, it, it further benefits everything, right? And it goes to what you said at the very beginning about optimizing your workflow. Like, do you need the 12 hours or you do need two sessions of a good three hours, right? It's like, that's the way that I think of structuring things in terms of the goal for how I try to kind of orient it around. I try to make everything part of the program because a cheat day is only a cheat day if it's not part of the program if it's part of the program it's actually amazing because you get to like eat the burger whatever it is and it's helping you i think of the same thing with like the mindless entertainment it's like set it up so that it's actually part of the program yeah definitely it's it's a we all have a needed decompression time i think and whatever that works best for you with you know um games or a night out on the town, whatever it is, you know, it, it can actually pay off. Like you said, it's part of the program. So I want to start to wrap up the main section here. Um, but I wanted to ask, and I want to make this a part, a recurring part of the show, whenever you feel kind of not in the mood for scoring, writing music, what piece of music 
gets you back into really remembering why you love doing this? Man, there's a couple. Um, it'll either be something like, man, some of Hans Zimmer's music is just so incredibly gorgeous and so well, especially because my current journey is trying to get better at production. I'm not trying to be that level of production because I don't think I have that in me, but I would like to be able to just make things sound better. So I'll listen to like The Last Samurai or something like that, The Dark Knight, and just be like, oh my gosh, that's the ceiling. That's where it is. Incredible. Also, like The Planets. When I listen to The Planets, particularly Jupiter, because I think Jupiter is just utterly brilliant, it's like, okay, game on. Yeah. I, I would agree. I, for me, I'd say it's Jupiter. Um, the intro and the climax to Tristan and his old. Oh, yeah. I, I, th- that's probably the most, my favorite piece of music. Ooh, and- Mahler's Adagietto in his fifth symphony in C sharp. If you haven't heard that, it's, it's just a string orchestra and harp piece in the middle of this massive symphony. But the Adagietto is, is utterly gorgeous. Oh, I'll have to check that out. Um, and then, I don't know how to say it, but there's a WC piece that I'll link in the description that when I listen to it like every day and, and I feel like I get an infinite amount of like beauty from it and just like orchestrational and compositional um, nuance like that is not inherent in how I write. You know, I listen to this and it's like a different I mean, it, it is a different brain, but it's like a totally different, comes from a totally different type. mindset even. Yeah. You know, I can listen to the Wagner, right? And I feel like, I feel like I have some of this in me, you know, but the WC, like, I don't even know where this comes from, you know? <laughs> well, there, that, um, there's a really cool thing. There was uh, this YouTube fellow, he made a video. I don't remember what it who is what his name was which is unfortunate but it was basically composers all wrote a one minute piece on like the same brief and he just got a bunch of youtube creator composers to do it like adam neely was one of them um, which most people know adam neely uh in the music youtube world because he's he's one of the big youtubers and a couple other people um and yet they coming from the same musical motifs they all created wildly not just different interpretations of the motifs, but like stylistically, context- orchestrationally, and they were all writing for the same ensemble. That's the other important part. So it's the same ensemble, same musical material, go. And there were these romantic pieces. There were these more jazz vamp type pieces. There were such cool orchestrations and colors. And it, it really is. It's like everybody, and this is at Berkeley, I was really interested in what the drummers would write for their MAT projects mm. because drummers don't write music like that usually. Um, their music and their thinking, what, what does a drummer primarily think if we're thinking melody, harmony, and rhythm uh, as the three primary factors of music, what is a drummer, what does a drummer put at the front of that? It's obviously gonna be rhythm, right? Mm-hmm. Whereas most composers are gonna put either melody or harmony first, depending on your, affinity for writing good melodies or affinity for writing spicy harmonies, you know? So it's like, it's so cool. The, the, the minds that music comes from, everybody has something that could be so awesome, like so different, so impossible for me to comprehend that music. I think everybody has that in them, uh, which this is a discussion for another day, but it, that's why it pains me that so much of our music all sounds like the same Hans Zimmer ripoff or the same wannabe John Williams. It's like, you have, you, we're, we're trying, the Debussy might be there, but we're trying to sound like Stravinsky and Gustav. It's like, Debussy doesn't sound anything like them. And if Debussy tried, he'd fail. And if Debussy tried, he might've never been Debussy, you know? So it's like, I think as composers, we're missing a lot of the inherent brilliance in the individuals and that we all have hiding by trying to chase what people have, what the people that already found that for themselves and put that out there. We're just like, oh, doing the legwork on my end is too hard. I'm just going to try to copycat that. <laughs> no, totally. And, and it takes time too to evolve, you know, your, your influences. What would you say your biggest influences musically are and 
can you see them manifest it in your own in your own work right now it's um it's always gustav holst that man can never not be an influence for me although i have yet to study him to the extent that i could to really figure out all the things he does that make me interested but i always come back to holst um and for film music right now and it's this is more recent because i haven't i've been mostly a, a student of the orchestral composers like john williams um bernard herman like some of that but recently it's been Hans Zimmer's music because I've been trying to listen to music and even try to write some music with the more layered approach, which is also very common in video game music, writing in layers as opposed to sort of a linear story. Um, and that has been cool, picking, to, picking apart how he creates layers and builds up a sound over time. So that's been a recent just little interesting aside that I've been taking myself on as a composer because I've never really given the layered music too much credence. I like the music that's more lush and flows, but there's something undeniably compelling about something as simple as time, right? Which is the classic one. So that, that's been something that I've been listening to also, not just time, but that type of writing perspective. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I think, I think I've, was thinking about mine and I would say probably Wagner, William slash Holst and Metallica probably honestly because like I don't know how many hours of Metallica I played in high school right and there's a certain like bombastic rhythmic intensity that like I feel like the music I've been writing has and I don't think it's from any orchestral music you know, I think it's from my background in playing in metal bands, in hardcore bands, and just having the groove and the, like, explosiveness kind of drive it and using orchestral techniques to implement that. But I definitely see some of those more pop music and, you know, uh, non-orchestral influences coming through. I, it's funny that you mentioned that because a lot of, um, before, like I said before that I got into the more orchestral music, I was into the rock and metal and, and heavy metal. So I definitely find that the rhythms and the complexity of how I think of rhythms come from like metal breakdowns, like the messing around with weird triplets, the messing around with weird time signatures and weird accents all comes from those like super chuggy like dun 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 ba bum ba 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 bum bum ba bum like kind of stuff like that um which is funny because if you track all that i feel like beethoven was the original metalhead beethoven like just the fifth symphony is just a powerhouse of rhythm just flying and then you've got rachmaninoff who's also a metalhead and then you had uh Holst with Mars, the classic Mars, which is just rhythmic power personified in an orchestra. It's so cool how music, it all ties together, right? Like I was listening, if you look at Mozart, Beethoven, blues, jazz, pop music, and, and a lot of like just romantic piano music and film music, it all comes down to the same DNA. They're, they're pulling from the same source crowd and it's like one, four, and five, right? Mm -hmm. What they put in between them and how they do it, it all different. Like I was listening to the, it was on the radio while I was in the car, the, the Billie Eilish bad guy song, which probably everybody and their mother knows. The song's like a blues. It goes one, then shifts up to the four, then back to the one, the only thing she doesn't do is go up to the five. Like it's basically the first half of a 12 bar blues that just repeats, you know? So it's like, it's crazy how all of these things to, to quote, I don't know who said it, but there's some famous quote that's right. Like there's nothing new under the sun. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where I find that the, the internal voice is so important in music to try to find the part that's you because there is no other you under the sun. You know, we've heard, the orchestra has been an orchestra. The harmony has been the harmony. There's not 
likely to be much innovation coming from there at this time that's crazy new other than the spin that you yourself could put on it that nobody else can because nobody else is you. Yep. Cool. Um, so before we move on to the last section that we call the off topic, um, I have one more question based off something that you briefly mentioned earlier. You mentioned Starbucks, you know, when talking about, you know, saving money. Um, so I understand you don't drink coffee. Um, so I just have a couple questions. How did this unnatural phenomenon come to exist? And would you say that it's the primary or secondary reason that you're not scoring AAA films yet? Oh, uh, yeah. Well, there's, we're going to give the, the hard answers to this one, Alex. Um, <laughs> it's because I don't like the taste. That's the first reason. I don't like the taste of coffee. And uh, it'd be, I didn't, because I don't like the taste of coffee and because I don't really drink soda, um, it's because I'm cheap, Alex. So, like, I don't like coffee because I don't like the taste. So that's one source of caffeine. That's the same reason with tea. I don't like the taste of tea usually. So I just don't like it. Where else do you get your caffeine? Soft drinks, but water's cheaper. <laughs> so I'm like, I just don't do the coffee. And then I just, my body adapted to just not use caffeine. Like I don't use a caffeine to jumpstart my morning. Like I just, I do my thing. Even when I was working at the gym uh, and I had to be there at 4.30 in the morning and wake up at like 3.40 in the morning to get there, to train people at five in the morning and be bouncing off the walls. Never did coffee. So I don't know. I'm like a weird mutation. Um, it is, it is, but it's, it's a hard pill to swallow because most definitely it is the primary reason that I'm not scoring triple A films right now. It's there's, I can't think of anything else. I'm like a near perfect human being in every other respect. And my craft is at the highest that it could be. Um, I lied. My mixing is incredible. So I don't know, but I hate the taste of coffee. So I feel like I might just be destined for failure. Yeah. Well, I mean, you may have to compromise your values, you know, to get there. So I might. Sacrifices must be made. Yeah. Well, fair enough. So at this time, I want to move on to a section that I poached from my other podcast, which I host with my business partner called The Switch where we talk about ideas that change people's minds. And I'll link that in the description here below if you want to check that out. Um, but the section is really cool. It's called The Off Topic. And it's basically where we have our guests bring up a non, in this case, non-music related topic. It could be anything, something someone said to you in the line at Starbucks, which is appropriate, a uh, charity you'd like to promote, a favorite book. Or if you're looking to ruin your career, you could go with a politically divisive topic. So... Kyle, what do you have for us? I guess what I was asking about is um, the one that I thought of, and I, it ties a little bit into composing, but more into life. And I think of composing as life because it's a facet of life, but it's relatable if composing was standing. Um, it's just the, how the dynamic of health, mental health, energy changed and how the, our response could be with like the COVID-19 situation, the lockdowns, the isolation, the quarantines, you get into the sort of compelled nature of it. So whether you agree or not with the compelled nature of some of these lockdowns, like the fact is you were in your house for two weeks or whatever. I wonder like, how did you feel that that pressure affected your life? Did you think like, oh, it'll be fine? oh, and now it's not fine. Like I, I figured lockdown would be one way. It, was, it met my expectations. It was different, good or bad. Uh, I guess just thinking of the adaptations that we need to be able to make to keep ourselves healthy, functional, while being responsible, uh, because obviously the things that might have been go-tos for decompression or whatnot are, are all closed. Yeah, so for me... Um, I've said in the past, it didn't really affect me very much because I already lived a COVID type of lifestyle before, um, pretty isolated. And um, the biggest place I noticed it was in relationships, right? People who have a harder time with it, people who are more extroverted and the impacts that that had on them. You know, um, one thing I have noticed is kind of a sorting out of priorities that I think is actually helpful long term, you know, noticing toxic things, noticing bad relationships um, that come from not being able to distract yourself with the traditional things, you know? Um, 
as far as personally um, with work, I work well with having a lot of time where nobody's telling me what to do. That's kind of my sweet spot. And my natural thing, like my natural drive is to work, right? I think I got this from my dad, probably just always a project, always something to do. And I have my goal of my career. So I'm constantly looking for ways, seeing the world, like, how can I use that to, to, you know, incorporate into my career idea? Um, and I think I've been lucky that I've been writing, like journaling for the past year, about a year ago. I started journaling, trying to do like 500 words, 300 words a day. And that's what turned into this YouTube channel, which I'm going to upload later today, a video kind of intro to that. Um, but naturally, I like the free time. Most, I don't live near any of my friends. So I already met with them virtually. Um, I would like to be able to go home and visit my parents. Um, so this is the longest I've ever been away from home, I think. Uh, but yeah, I, I would say to me, again, not much has changed. I've just, if anything, cr started creating more content. How about you? Well, for me personally, like very little change because, you know, I was, I'm able to teach clients or train clients over the, uh, over the virtual, I'm able to teach my students over the virtual. Um, all I did was I'm no longer commuting, but I, I actually really realized I enjoyed my time commuting because that's when I listened to a lot of like podcasts and stuff like that. And that's when I, that was sort of my me time to think. And now it's like, there's not as much me time to think. I need to kind of just like set a time to go for a walk and do that because I was naturally getting that from commuting. And to go back to what I'd said about like the environment, I felt like personally just a big slowdown, even though my day-to-day -day routine hasn't really changed that much. I feel like so unmotivated to, to get at it because it's like when everything is moving around me, I'm like, let's go when everything else just, even though I'm not directly interacting with all of that, because like I'm mostly just doing my thing. But when everything just sort of grinds to a stop, I'm kind of just like, might as well stop. Like it's, I, I'm just very dependent upon, um, not dependent, I'm very receptive to the environment and the speed of it going on around me. And I'm, and it's, it's good and bad, because in one way I'm highly adaptable to different environments. But if the goal is dependent upon me being like on it um, and the environment grinds to a halt, I like find it very difficult to, to keep going. Like obviously I'm still working, I'm not doing nothing, I'm still staying on it, but I feel like I'm exerting a lot of effort to try to keep myself productive and moving forward. It's like the, the voice in the back of the head to just like fuck off and chill out by a, by a pool or whatever because of COVID is just like, and it, it was less so in the beginning, but especially like now as we're getting into like, oh my God, like month five of this thing, six or so, I'm definitely feeling the, uh, the push or the, the, I guess not the push, the, <laughs> the pull. Yeah, no, I, I think that a very, that's a very common sentiment that I hear, you know, and I may just be unaware that the same thing's happening to me, you know, <laughs> maybe well, yeah. you, might, you might have done what you said earlier, where you, cause you mentioned like it was over the past year that you've been journaling and doing these things. You were just setting yourself up to, for the getting yourself primed. And now you're slowly declining. You, you just don't even know it, buddy. <laughs> By December, you're going to be like, shit, it was right. But that's like, I've been just putting my efforts in like thinking and philosophically to try to find ways to push back against it because um, I've even noticed it with some of my clients, they're like, you know, working out used to give me so much energy, but now it's like, I feel like I'm just so tired before and after I work out. I'm like, well, because that's, that's now, that's your only exercise. You're working out before you would work out to jumpstart your day where you would go out and do things. And even though a lot of my people are retired or not working um, be before the COVID stuff, just in general, that's my, a lot of my clientele, they would 
go to lunches and then go kind of on the shopping, run some errands to make sure that they had everything for when their husband got home or whatever it is. And I'm like, and now you're not doing any of that. So it's like your body's not running. It's doing the sort of one lurch, which is good for you. And it is healthy to still be working out. But then afterwards, it's like, there's nothing. And it's like, and you and I know with, with what we learned from Christian and whatnot, your body adapts to what you're having it do. So even if you're working out, that's not enough to keep it in the game if the other 23 hours are highly sedentary, right? Yeah. So I've just been trying to find ways to kind of push against it and keep some semblance of the things that we were all passively getting normally. Even again, you don't have to directly be interacting with things, but just passively. You were moving from place to place. You were outside getting some degree of sun, even if it was just the four to five times a day you were walking to and from your car into a building. There were things that we were getting interaction with different people on a face to face level. Um, without some weird barrier, whether it's the mask or the plastic thing that they put up in front of cashiers at the, at the you know, grocery store or whatever. It's like, there were just so many things that were working for us. Same with muscle tightnesses, right? It's like, you know, obviously just walking around and being active all day is not better than like rehabilitative stretching, but it's going to do better for your mobility if you are mobile. Um, and that happened passively for a lot of us. So it's like the, the thing is, I've been trying to figure out what were the passive things that got taken away that were benefiting me and other people around me? And what are some active things that I can do to make up the difference for what I was passively getting? Yeah, I, that actually brings up an idea for me, which is the walls are wider, right? There's a certain kind of, um, you know, increased productivity, I think, when you have more stuff to do. We alluded to this earlier if we didn't outright talk about it. But when the walls are closing in, you get everything done faster, right? And I do think that's some of my work has expanded to fit the time I gave it. Oh, yeah. That's definitely something I have noticed. I've spent way too long on some tracks where, like, if I had had, you know, oh, well, I'm going out on tomorrow night to dinner and then Saturday we're going to be, you know, uh, visiting my you know girlfriend's parents or something just having these kind of blocked out times is helpful to put everything else in perspective but now it's like well seven days a week you know 24 hours a day I, I could be working so you know there's there's a certain level of lack of deep work that I've been doing lack of you know less focused that I do think I should be more mindful of but um Kyle, I think that's a good place to end this. I definitely want to, would love to have you back. Um, I'm going to try to do this fairly regularly as one of the primary components of this channel, because I think just conversation in general is something that's helpful. And I want to try to get at some more of these topics that, you know, can be helpful to people, right? Thinking about actually optimizing, thinking about living a better life, not just, oh, how do you do that chord? What is that note? You know, because these those are resources I think that many people have done probably far. What plugin is that? <laughs> exactly. Always the plugin, never the never the user. Exactly. Um, so Kyle, thanks for coming on the show. And um, is is there anywhere you'd want to direct people to check out your work or to follow you or to hire you? <laughs> <laughs> no, not really. Um, I'm sort of trying to build up myself before tossing things. I, I think I have some tracks on like SoundCloud. Um, I think it's Kyle Franklin Composer, but uh, that's also probably something that I need to shape up. But I'm just trying to, sh I'm trying to first shape up my actual quality of work before I shape up a type of social media presence. But um, that's, I hate social media, but it's a necessary beast. It would be kind of funny to have a like super polished website and branding and then you click play and it just sounds like, you know, a high schooler did it. But that exists, man. That exists. There is there is a website for a composer where all the time was spent on the presentation and none of it on the craft. And you're going to listen to it and it's like, oh my God, the drums sound like they're in front of the strings, which sound like they're behind the French horns, which sound like they're way in front of the trumpets. Like, it exists. You mean that's not a traditional orchestra layout? <laughs> it's like, you mean I need to redo all my reverbs and panning? 
What? I, I set up 200 instances of Altiverb. Oh, know. no. Angel. All right, awesome. Thanks for having me, Alex. Great chatting with you always. Yeah, same, buddy. All right, well, we'll talk soon. Thanks. Yeah, peace.